Greg here with Elton Selections. Thank you for clicking on our video. If you would like to taste along with us, click the link in the description and that'll bring you to the wines we are enjoying today. Don't forget to sign up for our email list. We offer all of our subscribers exclusive deals on our wines. And don't forget to follow us on social media for extra content, subscribe to our YouTube channel and enjoy the tasting. All right, I think we're ready to get started. Hey everybody, I'm Greg. I'm here in the States helping uh, people pick out their wines. Um, Steven is here, he's a WSET certified teacher and lives at the domain and gives people tours and things like that when you're in Chromie. And then obviously Dennis, the proprietor of Elton Selections, uh, curates all these fantastic wines for us. So we're happy today to have a great tasting set up for you. Uh, today we will be tasting Jean Marichal. Uh, this is Mercury VA Vin 2018. And then the next one is his Premier Cru, Cru Clos Levesque, coming from Mercury as well, 2018 vintage. So we're going to really get to compare uh, different um, vineyards and seeing what the difference between a Premier Cru versus, you know, a village wine is um, and really get to see the difference in quality. Um, so, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, Thank you. We love doing these tastings and I think this is a first one where we've done same producer, um, same vintage and different terroir on this format. We've often done it in Chrome, we've often done it with guests, we've often done it with other types of tastings online, but I think um, it's the first time that we've done it on one of these on this format. So it'll be interesting to dig in because when we have the same producer, you're going to have a lot of the same, obviously, one making techniques, same yeast, same harvesting styles often. And um, with the same vintage, of course, we're talking about the same weather, especially with plots so close as these plots are. And so we're digging into really, really what Burgundy is all about, which is terror, and to explore the difference in terroir with the same producer, same vintage, different terroir, you can dig into that. And it's just very interesting to do. Yeah. And uh, I know VAV means old vines. So normally there's not necessarily like a legal definition where to put that on the, um, the label, but usually, you know, it's, you were saying that it's like 40 years old or more, Stephen? Yeah, well, VA vein isn't a, it's not a legal term, you know, that where there has to be a certain amount of age in vines. It means old vines. So, um, but I was saying within Burgundy, your neighbor certainly would give you some funny looks if you put it on a, on a bottle and they knew your vines were like 25, <laughs> 30 years old. They'd probably be looking at you thinking it's not right. So, um, even though it's not, it's not regulated, the term, um, you know, people, vignerons regulate it amongst themselves. Burgundy is, is, a, is a small village. <laughs> and, and, and usually, I mean, it's sort of accepted that 40 years is the, is the beginning of the evening. But if, if, if it's marked on the label and it's true, it's an important thing because, um, the, the, the thing about the grapevine is that it, um, they, they do everything they can to inhibit um, surface root growth. So you, they're, they're trying to get the roots to go deep. Um, and when we say deep for a vine, they can go like 50, 60 meters down into all of this broken up rock and, 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 um, and uh, um, uh, di diverse geological structure. Um, but the great advantage of it is that old vines are less productive, which means that they have more concentration in the actual number of grape bunches that they produce. And in times of drought, they, they go and find water themselves deep in the soil. So, I mean, you, you have much, you, an old vine um, produces a, more, a, a much more stable, rich, concentrated uh, fruit than a young vine. So, I mean, if, if old vines is, if, if, if it says old vines on the label and it's true, it's an advantage. Right. Yeah, yeah so Greg, Greg, this is, this is nothing against you, but you know, older, older 
it's similar to older people. The productivity mightn't be there, but hopefully the quality is hopefully the quality is higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. My my roots are pretty deep right now. <laughs> I saw, um, when I was living in Wisconsin, I saw a grapevine, just a wild grapevine that had like a trunk, probably about four or five feet around. You know, it's never tamed wow. or anything. And I can't imagine how, and it just climbed up a tree and wrapped itself around and it became like a new tree, which was kind of- yeah, like, a, like a vine, yeah. like Tarzan. Right, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that's just the kind of the depth of which, what vines can do. Even though you think of it just as a small plant underneath, it goes quite deep. Oh, there's a lot of controlling it, but that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, they, how do they, they, so they plow using horses still? Do they have to do that? It, well, in, in, in the, in the more, in the really uh, uh, valuable plots they do, mainly because the, the horse doesn't compact the soil as much as the tractor. So that what they're trying to do is, is oh, okay. when they go through and they plow and they, and they get in between the vineyards and that kind of stuff. If you go and roll on top of that with a tractor, then you're defeating the purpose of what you've done with just plowing. So, the the reason to do it with a horse, in a di in addition to the to the fact that it actually shits in the vineyard and it leaves you a little bit of fertilizer, um, is that it's is that it's it's not as heavy as a tractor. I gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. But there's some very cool vines. I mean, this year we actually, if guys check out our YouTube channel, there's a video of Claude de Chateau. Um, being plowed with a tractor, but the but the guy um, has a little handpiece on the back, and he's running in and out between the young vines in Clos de Chateau for which is the chateau of um, of of Domaine de Crome. So, okay. so watch that out actually... for that in a few years' time. It was just really interesting, like how you know, even with even with mechanical plowing, sometimes they're using these these adapted tools to get in and, in and amongst the vines. Okay. So well, that's, that's, that is the big problem is that you, you can plow between the rows, but how do you plow between the, the actual vines? And that's, okay. you know, so they, 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 there are all kinds of inventions and there are some, and some, some, some very clever ones to get between the actual vines themselves. Not in, not in the rows between the vines, but in the, in the space between the, the plants. You know, in, right. that, in that line. But anyway, it's all it's that's all just you know machines and 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 and, and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of hard work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're we're in a very interesting village with Mercury, out outside the Cote d'Or, most probably the most famous red wine village of the Cote Chalonnais, and with a family that are, we'll just say established. I think it's like the oldest records go back to the. 15, 1570 or something like that for, for uh, the Marichelles in, in Mercury. So yeah, this is the uh, map of Mercury. And if you, I zoom in right here, this is the Levesque that we're tasting. And then the VAV. That's the Premier Crew, yeah. Yeah, that's the Premier Crew. And then the VAV vineyards are right here. Yeah, it's So three, you'll, notice, you'll notice, You'll notice that they're very that they're very close together. Okay, quick geological explanation of Mercury. Mercury is a huge in, in terms of Bur in terms of Burgundy. It's a huge uh, Appalachian. It has a lot of uh, surface area, a lot of acreage, um, and it, it, in that it, it, it area there are like five distinct geological zones. You'll see if you look on it closely at this map. There's a river running through the middle of it. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see La Giroux, and then you can follow the river through the through the town. And essentially, that's that's north side and south side of the river D divides the divides the Appalachian into two main parts already. And then, if you start to look at where the Premier Crew is, and 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 in, in, in the in the you know the red zones, you'll see that they actually form like sort of lines. Those are valleys coming down to the river. If you, every, everywhere you see one of those down here and then down below on the south side, those are valleys coming down the river. So it's really very similar. If, if, you, know, if you know Chablis at all, very similar to what Chablis is. Chablis has a river running through it and then the, and then the side valleys coming in. And what that means is that you end up with a ton of diversity. Uh, here you have five different geological types from pure um, uh, pure uh, calcare with very little soil to really deep soils 
to just sort of the 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 um, the, the clay that runs off the hillsides down to the to the river valley, right at the bottom of the river valley, is you have a heavy clay soil, and and all of those soils determine a style of wine. If you have a really high limestone content and not a lot of soil, you're going to get a wine. It's almost it's, that's that's a soil that you would not generally think is appropriate for white wine. And there is some white wine in Mercury. It's only about 10%. But um, at, as you start to add marne and clay, you start to end up in, in, in soils that are apt for red. And in Clos-Lévesque and, and in this Vieille Vigne area that we're talking about, there's a very deep, um, uh, it's a very deep red soil, really red soil. I mean, colored red, not just red for red wine. And you'll, you'll see that as a, a one of the main expressions of mercury. As a, as a matter of fact, it's probably the it's probably the classiest expression of mercury. So when you see Clolevec there, wrapping around the the hill, those are those are the most reputable of the of the Premier Cru. And what it gives you is it it tends to give you, as opposed to delicate little fruit, it gives you sort of deep black cherry and lots of lots of oomph in the wine. Um, and that's that's kind of what we're going to be looking for here. We have a, a, a village wine from JV and we have a Premier Cru Clolevec grown very, very close to one another on similar types of soil. So it's an interesting comparison. Right. And so we have a question. What really, um, so what makes it, you know, because they're so close together, what is, and there are sim similar soil types, what makes Clolevec a Premier Cru versus uh, the, the VA Vien? Is it more of like Mr. words. Mr. WSET can tell you that. <laughs> I think I, I really think it's important that people remember the, the whole. We often come back to this when we talk about the classification of all the vineyards in Burgundy from regional, village, premier crew up to grand crew. And the word that I'm kind of stuck on and everyone should remember is potential. So, what it is, is the vineyard is being given. The, you know, the impression or the, the idea is Clolevec has the potential to make a Premier Cru quality wine because of its terroir. It's really, really as simple as that. Now, if the wine makes better than its potential or worse than its potential, that's down to the vignon, the winemaker. So, you know, when, when, when you talk about potential and classification within, vin, within Burgundy, you have to consider the winemaker and the terroir. And then things like the vintage come into it and loads of other um, considerations, but they're, they're the really big ones. But because something is designated as Grand Cru or Premier Cru, does not automatically make the wine that, you can label it at that, it's classified as that, but the, but the actual quality of it is not that. A wine can this, drink was this was something that was done in the this was something that was done in the 1930s. They set up a classification system of the, that 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 was based on centuries of experience, uh, and it's and it's it's pretty it's held up pretty well. You can you can change the you can you can make a petition to change the classification of your vineyard, but it's a it's a long process, and it's and and it it, it rarely happens that say. A village wine is promoted to a Premier Cru, but the the, the actual classification itself comes from a a a a, 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 a people the um, uh, what do they call the INAO the uh, people who who named the Appalachians and that was done in the 1930s. Yeah. Okay, but but Clovec is Clovec is interesting. I mean, it just shows you know Clovergeau. All, all these clothes, someone built a wall around them often over a thousand years ago. You know, so the quality was recognized back then. So the potential on the vineyard was recognized back then, a long time ago. And I think Clos Levesque refers to the Bishop of, of Chalon. So this was the, Evesque, I think, comes, is, is connected some way to the word Bishop. And, and um, so this was the Bishop's vineyard. So we're talking hundreds of years ago and like before any geological studies, people just knew because they drank wine, made wine, lived wine. They knew what quality and they built a wall around the quality vineyards and said to the riffraff, you guys can make wine outside this, but inside this, this is for the king 
the bishop, the monks, you know, the people that... And so that's why the clothes were formed. So if somebody, if somebody took the trouble to build a wall around a vineyard and turn it into a clove, you can, you can often, as you know, um, you can often assume that, that, that the vineyard within that clove has the potential to make some great wine. And it happens a lot at Grand Cru level, lots of clothes, Premier Cru, village, but also even at regional level with our own famous Clos de la Car Carbonade, which is a clo, a regional level clo, but somebody's still taken that effort to protect it with a wall and say, this is a clo. So just, it's just always important to try and, and get people to think about Burgundy in them terms. And it's obviously the classifications, the Premier Cru's, you know, they're more expensive and they, you know, they've got more potential to make great wine, often do make better wine. Um, so definitely not to be dismissed, but it's just, it's just important to understand, you know, the whole classification and why, and that it happens at every level. You get, you'll get winemakers that drink above their classification and you'll get um, vineyards that are drinking better or worse than their original classification. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I just didn't, um, is there, you know, like when they were classifying it, was it, as far as the terroir goes, the difference, like it was further up on the hill, it gets more sun, like things like that? Um, because they, there are, you know, they, 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 I mean, if you go right back to the very beginning, the monks were working these, were working these vineyards back in the 1200s. So they got to know, well, you know, when you like we were talking about, you know, earlier today, guys, when we, we, we had our little talk meeting among ourselves, you know, where where's the snow melt first? You know, yeah. where does you know where where does this where's the sun, you know, at, at you know where's this what when the when the sun comes up, how far up the hill is it shining on? I mean, they get to know this kind of stuff, and they that's why we have all of these different parcels, and they and they have individual names is because. This hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of these guys working aura a labora for you know they weren't getting the paycheck they were they were out there um, uh, uh, you know thinking about the land and looking at the land and analyzing it so they knew pretty much where good wine was made and th when the, when the time when the time came to classify that and to analyze it and to do scientific soil studies and that kind of stuff they were pretty much spot on with what their you know with 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 what their studies over the centuries had proven so it was it wasn't really they weren't just making this up they weren't saying okay well we, we're going to award that because, uh, up on the hill because it's looks like it's probably in a good position they just knew they already knew they knew for hundreds of years yeah that's yeah that's that's fascinating yeah that makes yeah. sense though but generally if you talk about the foot door you know and you want to be very generalistic about it you could say mid slope is the warmest you're looking for sun traps historically so mid slope is the warmest warmer than the top or the bottom of the slope because if okay. you shine if you shine a, a torch onto a ball you know as the it hits the mid mid spot full on and as it gets to the curved spots the light is diffused so sure. you know the intensity is is on the mid spot so mid slope is is more intense and then you know um and obviously, on the Cote d'Or, southeast, south, southeast facing is is good. Mercury has a different um, situation, and I really like Dennis's um, um, comparison with Shabli. It's a really, really good one because in Shabli, you know, you have one Grand Cru with these seven climas, and it looks, it does look very, very similar when you put it next to the map of Mercury, and you see this same kind of formation where all these sun-trapped um, vineyards are all connected to each other, slightly different aspects, but all still facing generally the same way and trapping the sun. Um, it's interesting going forward, even within some of the Grand Cru's, you know, you, and Premier Cru's, you see these sun-traps, but of course nothing is uniformly flat. So there's little dips and some areas that are, that are um, a little bit more exposed to heat or wind. And there is, a, there is an argument to say now as vintages get hotter, some of the areas that maybe historically 
suffered a little bit compared to their vines not too far away for heat are now shining a little bit more because they're protected a little bit, they, they can hold on. That's a kind of a complex discussion, but it's interesting. There is slight variations, but right. historically, if you're looking for, for sun, warmth, yeah, you're going to go to more the the mid of the of the slope. Yeah. yeah. Shall we uh, start tasting these? Yeah. So one of the impressive things about um, Domaine Marechal for me is the yield. You know, they look for a really they brave they're brave with their with their pruning, very brave, and you know they're hitting the thirty five hectoliter per hectare yield on both these wines, which is really, really impressive. I mean, you're hitting kind of Grand Cru yields. You know, you're touching on, on it with these, the yields of these wines. And I think you can get it in the concentration on the wines. It's very impressive. And it's a brave thing to do for a winemaker, especially in 2018, where potentially the yield was a lot higher that they could have got. And if you remember, yield equals dollars or euros for the winemakers so to reduce the yield increase the quality shows how much you care about the wine so right. um, it's always a nice place to start to look at the yield and look and see what the winemaker is doing and very impressive on this this is three separate plots um from within within the commune around not too far from clolebeck So it's interesting, sorry, not to harp on, but we've got the same, we've actually got the same uh, winemaker, same vintage, same yield, different um, terroir. And a little yeah, bit and, 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 not, and not far one from the other no. either. It's, no. just, it's just like across the road. No, but I'm, at, I'm, I'm able to add on one more element onto my same. I've got a new one, same yield. <laughs> <laughs> They, they, they made them uh, slightly different though, right? You, had, you said there was a little bit of oak in the... Uh... Yeah, new oak, new oak on the Premier Crew. On the, on the Village Wine, they have just two uh, barrels, two to five years old barrels. And you can get that in the wine when you, when you try the side by side. And I think it's like the Clos Levesque, the structure of the terroir is allowing the wine to hold more structure of oak. Whereas on the um on the village wine you know it's a little bit easier right a bit yeah it uh it's i mean it smells lovely but it is it's like more uh perfumed fruits you know you still got a little bit of this um like strawberry cherry maybe a little bit of like perfumed black cherry um and it really is just it smells i haven't i, I mean i taste a little bit but it smells just so easy drinking where um, like you're not going to have a ton of tannins or anything, but on a nice hot summer day, this would be a great red wine to to drink out on your patio. Yeah. Well, if it's, it, and it doesn't it doesn't have the new oak, so it's just gonna it's gonna have the structure, and it's gonna but it's but it's also but it's also got sort of like the depth of the fruit, so it's gonna it's gonna you'd expect it to just by depth just by somebody explaining it to you that it's going to be round. Uh, one of the things that we're finding uh, a lot th these days is that some of these young producers. So this and this is an interesting situation. I mean, we, the the domain Marichal, we we came upon them at just at the time, of, sort of a cusp when they were changing from gen changing generations. And the two sons are, t are are taking over, and they and um, they've you, you can tell they've got touch. I mean, there's just there's just. Um, we tasted their wines in a restaurant in Mercury and um, a few years back and thought, hmm, that's very interesting. So we went to see them and it is, it's a new generation and they're doing, they're doing a lot of the things that the, that, that the younger generation are doing. One of them is in order to avoid putting too much sulfur in the wine, they're actually leaving a little bit of CO2 um, it, when they bottle, as opposed to when, when, when you bottle, you usually put a little bit of sulfur in just to protect it. So whenever it's traveling and that kind of stuff, but what you can also do the same thing with CO2 and it's, it's not quite as effective, but it's not sulfur. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a cleaner, a cleaner effect, but, and, and there's not enough CO2 that you actually feel it, but in, 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 in this sort of thing, you can sense it in, in terms of the acidity. There's a, it's almost, and it, it ends up, we've talked about this among ourselves too before, 
it almost gives you that sort of cola um, effect. You know, it's like it's not fizzy, but it's but it, it, it but it's 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 a, it's it's all too familiar. Right. It's so bright and so like uh, almost like effervescent in a way that it just tingles on your tongue. You know, it, it kind of yeah. reminds. Yeah, and it's, and it's, and, it, and you shouldn't you shouldn't actually feel it. Um, but that's that also depends on temperature, atmospheric pressure, all that sort of stuff. But you can tell that that's what's going on here is they're leaving just that little bit of CO2 on there to, to keep it bright. Right. Yeah. I think and, also protect the, it, and protect it. Yeah, the fruit profile also really helps because I get a lot of um, cherry, like dark cherry and marello kind of um, macerated, but unsweet macerated cherry on the wine. And I think it gives that deeper fruit note right into the wine which also helps that slight and colder background on the wine it's lovely very nice yeah it helps it helps uh, give it a little bit more depth to it you know instead of it just being a very lean wine um it kind of gives that that secondary burst of uh fruit notes to yeah like i said give it a little bit more body and more depth I actually, I actually really, really feel this um, old vine Mercury 2018. I, I, I think it's one of the best value wines that you can get. Like it just, I mean, for what it costs, it gives you such a quality experience in your mouth. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, it really, it really, really does. Not, not to give the hard sale, it's just an honest opinion. We drink a lot of wine. We drink a lot of different wines and, um, you know, this is just quality and it's, it's not expensive. I mean, people talk about, you know, Burgundy being out of price, but the quality of this wine for this price, I think it's, again, we come back a lot to, if you've done this on a blind tasting, it would be interesting for people that experience with Burgundy, they would be surprised at the price point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a lovely wine to drink. I mean, this is a nice tasting. And more and more, we would always suggest that people, let's say, you know, you're having dinner with friends, that you do the tasting this way. You jump from the the village to the the Premier Cru, or even start with the regional wine. You can get the still the 2018 Burgoyne, same producer, then move to the the village, then move to the Premier Cru. It's such a fun way to to, to try wine, and you know, and. I've been tasting a lot of wines like that recently. Like I just had uh, Jean Ferry um, uh, Cote Nuit Villages, uh, Village, um, 2018 and 2017. And I opened them both up and you can just, you can smell right away the difference between those two wines. Yeah. Um, and even with these two, like same vintage, same producer, just different plots of land, you can, you can smell it right off, off the bat that uh, yeah. there is a big difference with you know, kind of doing those things, but I think one of the best things about our site is that, you know, you're able, if you're able to go there and source in one spot, all these different variations of, of tastings, horizontal, vertical, I think we should start a new, a new um, word, a, a, a diagonal tasting, because we're coming <laughs> up with all different variations of tastings. Is that uphill and, or downhill? <laughs> 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 Before dinner, it's always diagonal up. <laughs> you start the tasting around eleven or twelve o'clock. It's a diagonal down. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's a real passion because people, you know that not, not, not even people that struggle to get burgundy, people that really want to get, or people that do understand and love burgundy, you know, to to taste the difference in terroir. Um, I mean, that's what we talk about. That's what it is. You believe in it. And so right. it's evident in the wines when you taste them, same vintage, same producer, same yield, you know, and then it's very cool. Yeah. So, uh, let's, let's move on to the Levesque. So, I mean, we already have, uh, talked about the vineyard and everything a little bit so i guess we can jump into the the tasting profile so right away i could just tell like that it uh on the nose is just so much stronger and um yeah i mean you can you can smell from like a mile away it's very deep fruits um 
It's really interesting. It's going to it's gonna have the structure of the new oak a little bit. Yeah. Every, everything is more concentrated, and and the oak is adding a lot of new flavor profiles to it. But the yield of the fruit is the same. So then you're talking, okay, well, if the yield of the fruit is the same, but the fruit feels more concentrated, is that because the vines, um, which are even older than the old vine, you know, so the older vines from Clos Levesque, even though it's interesting, they don't have old vine on the bottle for Clos Levesque, but the vines are actually older than the, than the old vine, village wine. So, you know, the fruit, the concentration of the fruit is coming from even older vines and terroir and the exposure to the sun, but the yields is the same. So, um, people ever put old vine on Premier Cruz? I don't know if I've ever seen yeah. that. Sure. Yeah, 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 of course. It yeah. Is. Just assuming something here before I check. Yeah, so really cool. So the, the, um, the Premier Crew is a degree of alcohol, more, is 1% higher in alcohol. So okay. that's very interesting. So, you know, the, the fruit is on the mid slope, sun trap. So, yeast eats sugar, creates carbon dioxide, alcohol. And because the sugar is higher on the, on the, on the fruit from the Premier Crew Vineyard, the, the alcohol is going to be higher. Right. So, therefore, you know, you do, you do have potentially more concentration within the fruit. I'm only discussing this because I know these, vi these two wines have got the same yield. Normally, if we were drinking these and we weren't thinking about it, we would just assume that the village wine had a higher yield than the Premier Crew. But because we know the wines of the same yields, then you start thinking, well, the quality of the fruit from the Premier Cru must be more intense. Right. You pick a grape off the vine, you pick a grape off the vine up in Clos Levesque from down in the thing, and you eat the, you taste the two. One, the Premier Cru fruit to start with is going to be of a higher quality. Which yeah. comes right back, right back to your original question about, you know, why is a vineyard given a Premier Crew status and why is another one not? And so it comes back to a simple thing as someone plucks the berry off a fruit, off a vine, and tastes it and go, well, this one tastes a little bit better than the one 200 <laughs> meters down the hill or up the hill, you know? Those monks have, must have had great taste buds. They did. They yeah. had got a, got really? a mind. They didn't have any other distractions. Yeah. So. <laughs> no Facebook or anything. <laughs> And the bishop. <laughs> I really get uh, like uh, almost like blackberry juice or like blueberry juice. Like it's a little bit more constant and like blackberry or black cherry juice. Um, yeah, it's just really juicy and like um, and refreshing uh, like at, at the front of your mouth. Um, and then it kind of obviously it gets a little bit more concentrated and I taste a little bit of like a vanilla um, or like a young, you know, oaked wine. Um, at the back. The vanilla is coming from the oak. Yep. Which is nice and integrated. And the oak is from um, the, the barrel making um, place in Mercury. Oh, gotcha. It's okay. quite a famous one that's there. Um, yeah. My French is so bad. The Tonne Louis in Mercury. That, the one that's there. So, um, but the vanilla comes from the oak. There's more spice on this on the Premier Crew as well. Intensity yes. of fruit. A little bit more sour cherry, I think. On the, the Premier Crew? Mm. I think so. What are you getting, Dennis? Yeah, no, I think that's I I I think that's fair. I you you know, I'm I'm still getting this I'm getting the same sort of black fruits I was getting on the other one. It's just got more uh it's it seems more structured and that will be a because of a little bit of new oak but it'll also be because of the complexity of the of the vineyard too you're getting there's more there's more art artifice in it in terms of the in terms of the winemaking but there's also more there's also more substance in it because of the because of the vineyard and that's i mean it's essentially what that's essentially what a premier crew is i mean the reason the reason that people put new oak on 
on wine is because there's usually enough stuff in the wine to support the, the to support the structure of the oak. Right. Yeah. Dennis, I've used that. I've used that. Um, you won't believe how many times I've used that technical term that you that you that you pulled out of the hat a few weeks ago. Stuff. Yeah. Stuff. I've used right. I've used stuff. that about. I've used that about 10 times in the last um, month. Well, the, the, no, <laughs> the, French, the French actually use, they say matière, which would be like material. So it's, I mean, stuff, mm. it's like yeah. there's stuff there. I, I, yeah. I've used it as well too. I think it's a great way to, to great. yeah, it's a great, great uh, way to, you know, uh, describe it because it is, it's yeah. just like, you can tell that there's more, more there than, yeah. you know, like than the VA bean, <laughs> just like, like when people talk about, well, wine is tight. Like, what does that mean? You're like, oh, it's just tight, you know? Just like, there's just- Yeah, but now, now we would just say, that means that the stuff is not exposed yet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the stuff's not <laughs> looking though. I mean, yeah, it's just, it is a great word. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, but stuff, stuff, is, stuff is not a word that we've used in English to describe wine. Like, there, you know, materier makes sense in French but you don't use the equivalent word in English. And so, you know, sometimes you just need that word to describe that the wine has just got, you know, Ooh, loads of yeah, flavor just, compounds, it's, time. We it's, know all, it's, it's all that stuff. It's, it's body, it's structure, yeah. it's, the, it's, it's the texture, it's the density, it's, the, it's all that stuff, you know? It's kind of like how people describe terroir, you know? Like terroir is a, is a group of things that go into each vineyard um, and this is just kind of like the group of flavors that go into the wine. The group exactly, of yeah. I've heard a Burgundy winemaker recently say terroir, you know, historically, I think originally people would maybe think of soil and then they started thinking about aspect and, you know, lo you know, loads of other positioning where it is and lots of other things. And then someone recently said, but it's not just that, it's, it's the winemaker, it's the history, it's the history of the family often. The because the, the way the vineyard has been farmed um, over hundreds of years in a particular way also um, connects in with terroir. For better you know, or worse. About, you know, it's, it's interesting, like how man, 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 I mean man as in human beings, affects terroir is an also an aspect that I hadn't really considered until I heard that interview. It was quite interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you, there, you, there were, you know, in the '60s when they were putting all this this potassium on the on the, uh, uh, you know, to as fertilizer. I mean, it's a salt, and then, so there's a. I mean, there's there there are vineyards in in the Cote de Nuit, you know, where you still to this day taste the salt because it, it, it once it's in the soil, it doesn't leave. You know, and they grow these grapes, and, and then everyone says, "Oh, it's really salty." Isn't that interesting? It's not so interesting. It's because they put chemical mm. fertilizers on it. You know. Mm. Right. Yeah. And then it just kind of gets into the soil and the vines yeah. suck everything into the soil up into their, you know, the roots and it gets yes, the it's better, better or worse. I mean, you, you, you would, you would call that terroir, but it's an, it's, it's a man-made effect. Yeah. Yeah. But it is still part of terroir and the effect of it is, and there's some vineyards that are affected more than others by that. Some, some vineyards you can really, you can really sense it in the wine. Right. I mean, thank goodness people like, Pascal Marshall and, and, and all of the people like him came along when they did in the early 90s and have had a, you know, a psychological and spiritual change into Burgundy and reminded the whole region, you know, what they can be and what they are, what they, you know, Really, really oh, yeah. 30, 30 years ago, when we first got here 30 years ago, if you were an organic producer, you were considered a loony. And if you were a biodynamic producer, they looked at you like, you, you know, you were some sort of, um, you know, um, you know, uh, dancing around the, the um, Stonehenge kind of, you know, that sort <laughs> of. Uh, and now it's, in, and, and, and now it's like, it, <laughs> everybody's everybody's organic it's all just gone the, it's, it's all gone the other way we all we all thought for years how could you ever possibly be an organic farmer in burgundy because you you know you you're right that there's such small plots and it's you know you could do your best and not use chemicals but the guy next to you if he uses chemicals is just gonna 
it's just going to drift across when he sprays. But it's more and more now. It's like I mean, it's this is the 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 um, the, the the future. The future is is organic production, and you can see you can see already the results. I mean, this, there's a, a generation, and this these the the Marischal brothers are are one of them. You can just see the 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 improvement in you know in in the generational improvement in the in the wine it's 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 an explosion in burgundy right now when well, you're choosing it, wine do you it's a, gold, it's a golden era <laughs> it, it, it really is i love how like farming practices are going back to the way that they used to be um, but when you when you're looking for producers do you tend to look for organic or biodynamic or you're just looking for what's great and all these producers just happen to be farming that way yeah, that's, that's, that's it. It's, it's surprising. You know, you just, you know, you, it used to be, we, you know, whenever we found somebody who made good wine, we'd say, who do you know who makes good wine? And then that, you know, that would lead you down the path. But these days it's like, we're, you know, cause we're, we, 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 we had, we we're so, we're so representative. We have so many good producers and that sort of thing. People actually come to us and, and, and ask us to taste their wines and, and represent them. And, um, and, you know, you, and you'll, you'll, you'll taste wines that you really, really like. And then it ultimately it turns out that that's what they're doing there. You know, they're, they are, they're of that ilk. They're, they're, they're doing the, they're doing the hard work in the vineyard that, it, that you have to do in order to make a great wine. Right. Yeah. 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 And I'd like to just say, you know, there was a wine we left out because we just generally do too, but there's also another premier crew, the Jean Martin which I really, really like as well, you know. And um, if you go onto the site and have a look at, at the, the Marichal page, um, you'll see, you know, there's that other premier crew that, that we have as well. Again, at the moment, I think it's still the 2018 vintage. Yeah. Which I suspect... The strong, the, the... Sorry, I was going to say the Sean, the Sean Martins is, an, is another profile altogether. What's interesting about tasting these two is that they're so close together, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, ge ge geologically, wow. geographically. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why we picked this because, yeah, we had yeah. that connection. But it's also really interesting, and just to let people know that there is another another one in the range there. Yeah, he also has his uh, um, going too, so. You know, buy a case and do the whole all four of them tasting <laughs> with some of your friends. Yeah. So, uh, do know, we have even though the 2019 vintage also is looking, you know, it has the same potential. I have this feeling that as soon as we start running low on this 2018 vintage, people are going to be sorry. <laughs> that haven't snapped up more for the seller. Well, yeah, that's how it always happens, right? The more the more we drink them, the more I just think they deliver. They're yeah. delivering so, so well and, and on lots of different areas. So. Yeah, like I said, the Jean Ferry, the difference between 17 and 18 was just like, I could tell the difference easily, which I was expecting to tell a little bit of the nuances, like maybe it's more concentrated, something oh, like that. But it was, yeah. yeah, it was no question. I think 17, 18 is the biggest, you won't get the same, I don't think you'll get, Dennis is better qualified than me to talk about this, but I think 17, 18, there's a huge, huge jump in vintage variation. I mean, some people prefer 17. They have very traditionally Burgundian vintage. Um, a lot of people prefer 18. So it depends on lots of, lots of different elements, you know, where the vineyard is, the winemaker, lots of things. But um, 18, 19, there isn't going to be as much of a jump. But I, I mean, we haven't drank tons of 19. We've done a lot of tastings originally on 19th to check that we're happy before they leave Burgundy. Um, and, but the more we drink 18, we're drinking a lot of 18 at the moment. And it just confirms, confirms, confirms. I think 18 is a great vintage for, for both red and white. Yeah, and, and you're right. There, 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 there are going to be similarities between the two. 19 is probably a more um, genuinely acidic uh, uh vintage 18 the 18 the 2018 vintage was saved because it was such a big harvest a big crop and um and so there was there was there was the there was just the the mass of wine and the and, and the acidity that, that came from that 2019 is a, is a much smaller harvest 
the alcohol levels are higher, but the but the the natural acid acidity is is there too. So it's you know, they're, even though they're going to at first be very similar, they're in the long run, they'll be very different. So as it ages, it'll, yeah. it'll change yeah. differently. Interesting. Yeah, but that's, always, that's always the case. That's the beauty of Burgundy. I mean, you have, because you only have one grape variety, you get what nature gives you. And, right. you, you know, and you, try, you tend to try and make comparisons and say, oh, this reminds me of the 85s. Uh, and, and in certain ways it will be, it will do, but there are no two vintages and they're ever the same. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, like, uh, like children and like children, <laughs> similar, <laughs> but no two the same. I mean, I think one thing that's interesting, I like another great wine from outside the Cote d'Or. So, you know, for people that are just new to Burgundy, listening about Burgundy, and they get, they can get fixated on, on Cote d'Or, which is Cote de Bonne and Cote de Nuit combined. So this is in a new area, Cote Chalonnet, one of the one of the villages of the Cote Chalonnet, probably the most famous for definitely. Yeah, and Mercury. I mean, Mercury is like I always say, Mercury is a microcosm of all of Burgundy. There's so much different, so many different um, geological formations that you can find wines that remind you of Cote de Nuit. You can find wines that remind you of Cote de Bone. I mean, there it's it's there's such diversity in Mercury. It's really really interesting. I mean, if you just you know it's it, it's you, you know, it, it, if, if you could just you could you could um, do comparative tastings in in Mercury and and um, and, ne and not get bored for sure. Which which is also a good comparison to Chablis. I feel that way about Chablis as well. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could just stay there forever. It's yeah. like no, no, no. That's I mean, it's it, it is the 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 comparison is really apt. Yeah, yeah. But, but the lesson comes back, it's the same one that's always repeated, it's about the winemaker, because you know, the potential, it's the potential. And there is, I have to say, Mercury is a region that I've been disappointed with a lot over the years. You, you try different producers and it just doesn't deliver what you expect. So when you find one like this, um, for me, it's really nice to just drink through the range of wines, you know? I always come back years and years and years ago, I thought of it like, you know, if you find a musician that you like, and then you just start listening to the music, well, then you just listen to album after album and you understand the musician. So you understand the album. <laughs> Once you find a winemaker that you like, you just can go through the range of wines. You understand the philosophy of the winemaker and the more you understand it, the more you understand the wine. Right. So, you know, that's a really cool thing, I think, to go through the wines of, of um, Jean Marichal and, and enjoy them that way. And so when you find one, especially in Mercury, uh, a winemaker that you like, enjoy the range. Yeah, cool. I, think, uh, I think that's a great way to end it. Um, yeah. You know, definitely enjoy the range, look for the producers. It's kind of like the bands, you know, like uh, Stephen was saying. So um, if we don't have any other questions, then you know, this is the, our tasting. Um, for the Jean Marichal wines and hope you enjoyed it. And we'll look forward to seeing some, uh, seeing you guys in the future for other tastings. Yeah, keep an eye out for the next tasting. I think have a look on our website for that and keep an eye on our social media. Um, it's really fun yeah. to do these, so. Yeah, yep, follow us on social media. We have a bunch of videos. Uh, we post a lot of pictures of our wines, new vintages coming up, uh, pre-sales and other things like that. Um, so, so have a good uh, rest of your day and um, enjoy the wines. Take care, guys. Bye. Yep, bye, -bye.